What's up and welcome to Nostalgia Pod, giving you your year in review 2021, reviewing the best movies of 2021 today. I'm joined by my trusty co-host, uh, super mover, movie watcher, mover watcher, Dave Martin Swagger. Dave, how many movies did you make it to this year? If you account, account for all years of movies, just in the calendar year of 2021, I watched 154 movies I had never seen before. It's like 13 ish a month, I think, is the math. And if you do just 2021 releases, it's like 102 or something like that. So, yeah, uh, even though people aren't necessarily going to see movies anymore, or when they go, it's very infrequently, they're still making them and I'm still watching them. And that's why I'm here, youtube.com slash nostalgia pod. Yeah, and hit, and hit us up on now. Uh nostalgia pod on spotify give us that five star rating in review um yeah you know making my list uh, i caught up on my letterbox today I'm, i've been pretty lazy with that this year new year's resolution keep up with the letterbox follow us there um i noticed that i saw more new movies in 2021 than ever before and i was like i don't feel like i went to the movies more but that's because how we watch new movies is evolving um with covid and the deal between time warner and hbo we got a lot of big movies right to our tv screens making it a lot more accessible able to consume more and it felt like every week we were reviewing a movie that was in theaters and one or two movies that we were able to just view at home on demand on one of the streaming platforms it, it's it's i think on on the one hand awesome that we're able to consume more but also, is that really what we want for movies moving forward? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic clearly has accelerated industry trends in a major way, meaning the box office is a zero-sum game, haves and have-nots, look no further than Spider-Man No Way Home, which as of time of recording is one of the highest grossing, 10, ten highest grossing films domestically of all time before inflation and yet barely anything else is making any money overall holiday box office is still down even if the huge mind share the huge you know uh, piece of the pie is, is technically still being earned so as you said is it a good thing because the business is changing right now it's a lot about selling a movie to netflix or apple increasingly apple where they have a content budget, they're going to spend the money regardless, so they'll spend a lot of it on a bunch of movies. And the movies don't necessarily have to make their money back, they just have to be on the service and part of the library. And that's a lot grayer than, say, we know how to make money, big movie or small movie, at the box office. It's just a very different side of the business. And, I'm, of course, we saw... A lot of fallout with that. Scarlett Johansson suing Disney, later settling due to how Black Widow was treated with Disney Plus Premier Access. Warner Brothers settling and paying out a lot of back end to their talent when they put every 2021 movie of theirs day and date on HBO Max alongside theaters. So it was definitely like a transition year, but I, I, I really unfortunately don't see it going all the way back i don't know how anyone could just because even when covid subsides i just don't see think we're gonna see the breadth of movie going the way we used to it's largely a franchise business and everyone else has to compete with everything else that you can manage your time with which is, includes a really impressive slate of television every year and everything else we know how to waste our time with so it's uh, definitely a change, and COVID's definitely accelerated it, and we still haven't seen the complete fallout. But, I mean, the box office is a clear indication that uh, th things are uh, continuing to progress. Yeah, and it's funny because, not, not, not to spoil our list too much, anyone that's been a loyal listener of the show can probably guess some of the movies that are at the top of our list. But um, I think one of the movies that we both really liked a lot this year, The Green Knight, is a type of movie that you go to theaters, awesome theater experience. One of those 
mid-tier movies that is probably in danger of not being made as we move forward yeah. here anymore, or at least is not going to be made to be released in a theater moving moving forward. And it's just so different, you know. Even something like No Sudden Move by Soderbergh is a movie that I can't. I, after I watched, it, I thought about, man, what if I had seen this in a movie theater and yeah. like I didn't have like you know my my phone buzzing next to me and you know checking that or. Uh, you know, people walking outside the, you know, outside the house or the apartment that you're in, kind of distracting you. Uh, what might have even been higher on my list per se. So it's it's just to, you know, it's it's disappointing that this is the way it's going, but something that we all are adapting to. Um, overall, good year in movies, bad year in movies. How are you feeling about it? It's a solid year in movies. I definitely don't like my list in 2021 the way I've liked past lists. Like I just have mm. more enthusiasm for other recent years than I do 2021. But I mean, I wouldn't watch 150 movies a year if I didn't still enjoy watching movies. So <laughs> still quite happy with the top 10, of course. But yeah, I mean, this this was kind of like the, uh, the spillover year, right? 2020, a lot of stuff was held and then finally released in 2021, whether that was on demand or in theaters and we had a lot of notable filmmakers make stuff this year right spielberg pta ridley scott twice wes anderson the list goes on and yet i still don't feel like it was a banner like best of the decade type year or anything like that yeah you know just as as we were talking i'm looking through my letterbox like top 10 for the last couple of years and it, it feels like this year is definitely a better year, I'd say, um, stronger year than last year, which makes a lot of sense. A lot of things got held back, yeah. and uh, you know, COVID year, we weren't going to the movies at all. Um, but you know, you look back at like 2019, yeah, it's huge not 2019, movie. Year. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's even not 2018 either. Yeah, so it, it's it's been a minute since we've had a year that. I, I want to say it's a weak year because I still think my top 10 lists are movies that I really enjoy. Maybe even my top 20 are movies I might find myself going back to uh, fairly regularly when I get a chance to. Um, but definitely not my one of my favorite movie years. So uh, I think we'll, we'll get into that more as we look at the list. Any other things off the top in terms of trends of the movie year or just I don't know, general thoughts about the movies? Yeah, so we kind of just touched on windowing and release and how that's box office and how that's all changing and shifting and we expect that to continue one other key thing i just want to know it's really kind of inside baseball stuff but if you look at how movies are announced now it's getting increasingly popular that movies are being sold uh in terms of a whole package meaning you have like the whole cast and director and script everything's presented as one unit and sold you're seeing this a lot with like apple and streamers and stuff where like matthew vaughn's movie argyle the complete cast and everything is already pitched and it's sold and uh you know goes to bidding and whatnot and apple buys for like 200 million dollars or something you're seeing a lot of that style of business right now i'm interested to see how that continues as the streamers become the major employers of anyone trying to make movies that aren't you know top end box office ip so will that squeeze out smaller movies that is always the fear of course right that you know when there's not a traditional way to make your budget back at the box office will smaller niche adult fare have a place at the table still at the streaming world to be determined but if you look at how movies are announced right now, it's a lot of uh, packaging. So just something to monitor as well. Why don't we jump into our lists here? Um, I'll go first. We're going to go 10 to 1, then recap the list and talk about a couple of things at the end. So stay tuned. But I'm going to start off with my number 10, a movie that I didn't see when it first came out, but was able to catch VOD. And luckily, I, I feel like I have a pretty good setup for VOD. So I feel like I still got to experience it quite a bit of the charm of this movie uh belfast the uh film from kenneth Branagh, uh you know based off of his life um and some of his experiences and uh you know following the story of buddy this little boy in uh, northern ireland and belfast obviously during the troubles in the 1960s um and kind of just this like 
story of, uh, of his family, the story of his life in Ireland during this hectic time trying to find his way while there's a lot of uncertainty around him, whether it's his father being away at work, his family being in danger of uh, debt and not being able to pay off their debts. Um, obviously, the issues on the block based on the uh, conflicts between uh, Protestants and the Catholics. It's uh, yeah, all shot in black and white. It's going to be an award darling this year. have no doubt there'll be a lot of nominations for it, whether they'll end up in wins. I'm a bit skeptical, but really, I think, anchored by some awesome performances from uh, Katriana Balfi um, and Jamie Dornan, I think, also super charming. Judy Dench and um, Kieran and Hines are also super wonderful in this. And I think really it's just about like sitting with these super heartwarming and kind moments. You know, there's a lot of tenderness to this movie, even though it can flip pretty quickly. You know, like I, I think um, the stereotype, the stereotypes of Irish people can be to that, like out those outbursts or the, that anger. Um, but a lot of times it's, uh, it's just really a nice movie. And um, I love the, the scene after the funeral or uh, the, after the yeah the funeral at the end when Jamie Dornan is singing to uh, uh, Katerina Belfi and just super magnetic scene. Um, I, I just liked being in this world for a little while. And I, I think it's, you know, it, it, when it first came out or, or was coming out at the uh, awards or at the, uh, the film festivals and getting awards there, people were saying, ah, this could be the Roma of this year. I, I, mm. It's not to that level. It's not to that. No. Uh, level storytelling or thoughtfulness i think in terms of the the meta uh story. or even filmmaking like this this is oh, kind of yeah. clearly shot on like a back lot like that the yes. that Belfast <laughs> streets clearly a set yes <laughs> definitely um but i do think that there's going to get, be a lot of love for this probably best original screenplay potentially best director nomination cinematography uh, yeah and i think there will probably be at least one um nomination for acting for uh Katriana. so um definitely worth checking out it is it is able to be rented right now um and probably will that price will probably go down pretty quickly right now it's like 20 ish bucks so yeah um, i'll get the when, normal price eventually yeah when you can watch I, I highly recommend it dave belfast wasn't on your list correct it was not a general honorable mention i liked the movie didn't love the movie i think for me i, I wish the conflict was a little more consistent in the film, I, I really it did come across as the troubles being like a a background thing, and I think that that, that is kind of the point because it's told through the eyes of a child, Brianna's perspective as a kid. So it makes sense that it's all in these shades of gray. But I wish that I wish that was a little more pressing. But the tender moments, the family moments, the relationships are the best part of the film, and like you said, those core acting performances are quite impressive. I think Kieran Hines also is in the mix for a supporting nomination. And yeah, Dornan, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't give Dornan much chance, but it is nice to see Jamie Dornan uh, give a strong performance in a movie people enjoy. You know, it's a, not uh, what we've seen from him in the early parts of his career when he became famous, of course. So that's cool. And uh, yeah, like Kenneth Branagh probably getting the best director look again I, I don't I'm not like wowed by the direction of this film but it, it it's still pretty sweet and i think that's what a lot of people seem to grab grab towards the most yeah just a last thought on that uh point about it being told through the eyes of a child the ending conflict is like the one moment of the movie where i just was like mm, is this really like thought through the way you want to tell it because obviously uh you have you have uh buddy being held at gunpoint by uh what's his name like jimmy balston or something like that yeah the uh, uh billy, billy clanton sorry right and, the local, the local uh, goon yes and uh jamie dornan pa disarms him by throwing a brick before the guy can fire a uh a pistol at, at him it just didn't make any sense uh and obviously it's supposed to be like you know like this is how the child perceived it it was definitely yeah. different but memory Yes, but um, I just found that to be a little bit like, it uh, didn't totally work for me, but still a really sweet film. 
Dave, uh, just looking at the, the background on YouTube here, I don't think your film is nearly as sweet as mine for your number 10. So you, you'd you think that, but not necessarily. <laughs> so my number 10 is Riders of Justice, which is a Danish film. The Danish title, I'm going to butcher this badly, is Referdens Reteri. Nailed it. I, that definitely spelled wrong. Riders of Justice, the English translation. Danish film came out in Denmark late 2020, came out everywhere in the rest of the world over the course of 2021, directed by Anders Thomas and Th- Anders Thomas Jensen, notable Danish filmmaker, Danish film. Uh, big talk of last year, of course, Thomas Vinterberg nominated for Best Director for Another Round, which won Best International Feature Film, like Another Round, Rise of Justice stars, most famous actor from Denmark, Mads Mikkelsen. And if you look at like the title, you look at the premise, you'd think, oh, this is kind of a revenge thriller in the vein of Taken with Liam Neeson, a uh, archetype for a film that we've come to know pretty closely in the past 10 years. It's pretty familiar at this point in the story of Riders of Justice. Uh, Mad's character is a soldier and he's away in the Middle East. Uh, and his while he's away, his wife is killed when a train crashes. His daughter survives the crash, obviously grief struck, and they both are. And someone else who's on the crash, a uh, scientist, surmises that maybe this crash wasn't an accident. There was a gang member who was set to testify against the gang, and he's killed on the train. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, line of thinking throughout the movie keeps coming back up about this wasn't a coincidence this was something we have to prove the police won't help us we must do this ourselves and you can imagine that this is gonna go down the line of marcus matt's character taking revenge against this gang and it doesn't go exactly where you think it goes but what i really love about it is all the characters and the relationships really start to sing by the end as our ensemble grows. We have all these scientists and tech people and we have the daughter's girlfriend, sorry, the the daughter's boyfriend. We have uh, some other people they meet. It becomes like a, like a found family kind of story about them kind of helping each other manage through this time while they still have these overwhelming plot momentum of trying to take down the gang and get that revenge. And it doesn't quite go where you want to, where you where you think it would go when you think of something like Taken, but I still think it's a really satisfying and uplifting film, and I would definitely recommend it. You can watch that on Hulu now, Riders of Justice. Definitely gonna check it out. Move, uh, you sold me just from that plot alone. Sounds really interesting. So, uh, we we've been watching more and more foreign films, which I, I think is a good thing. People should yeah. keep doing that. Diversify. Um, Dave, we're going to hop right to my number nine, which I don't believe you have on your list, but it's Coda, a yeah. movie that uh, premiered on Apple Plus or was, came out on Apple Plus. I watched it at home this year. Um, the CN uh, Header, CN Hater. I hope I'm saying her name Heater, correctly. Yes. I think it's Heater. Um, Breaks the Sundance uh, sale record earlier in 2021 from Apple. Yeah, and you know, kind of sticking with that, that feeling from Belfast, just a really feel-good movie. You know, coming of age tale about this uh, girl Ruby, who is the uh, a child of deaf adults and the only person with hearing ability in her family, um, and heavily relied upon by them to communicate with people who do not know sign language or are unable to communicate with them because of their hearing impairment. And um, her story about wanting to live her own life. Um, where she's this great singer with this ability to go to what was it Juilliard in in the film? I can't remember. Where oh she's yeah, trying, some yeah. kind of art school. Yes. Yeah, it's one of those art schools in Boston. Sorry, uh, Berkeley College of Music. Berkeley. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Juilliard. Um, in Boston. Yeah, and uh, her family not wanting her to leave them because they rely so heavily on her, and having to navigate that as a family, and the family coming to appreciate that this is her life path. Um, but also the, the grief of that, that she is, you know, she has this ability that they'll never be able to fully experience. Um, and, you know, this movie just really 
has sat with me as after I've watched it throughout the year. Um, obviously, I think a really strong performance um, by Amelia Jones as Ruby, mm. but also Troy Kotzer is up for best supporting actor in this. He yep. uh, as as the father, and um, just some really moving, uh, tear jerking uh, scenes between them, especially near the end of the movie as they uh, the family starts to become more accepting of this aspect of Ruby's life, her ability to sing, her ability to perform. Um, and they attempt to try to support her and to understand, you know, that, yeah. that final scene where she's trying out at Berkeley and they show up in the balcony above and she signs the song to them. Even just talking about it, I can, can like <laughs> feel the emotion welling up inside of me. It's a super moving uh, uh, scene and there's multiple scenes like that. And, um, not only do I give this movie credit for telling a really good story, uh, an emotional story um, and some really strong performances, but I think telling uh, a story that uh, to people that I don't think many people are aware of, you know, that yeah. I didn't even know what Coda meant before this movie came out. Same. So I feel like this uh, was not a movie I was totally expecting to be on my top 10 at the beginning of the year, but one that I'm pleasantly surprised to be here. Yeah. Coda, uh, I would say, deserves a lot of plaudits just for telling a genuine, honest story about deaf people and casting mm-hmm. deaf actors. Yeah, it goes a long way, and you're seeing the love and adoration for Troy Kotzer's performance uh, reflecting that. So yeah, I mean, Apple really going hard uh, in the content space. It was a huge, huge buy for a reason. I think they and they put in their full weight behind this one, the awards thing, but it's definitely definitely well well deserved. I think, you know, maybe at the end, uh, for me, it was a little, um, a little, little hokey at times, but I mean, the core beats and and and, and the relationships are uh, tough, tough to deny. And Amelia Jones also, I think, deserves a lot of yeah. what it says, like a you know breakthrough performer, performer on the rise type actor as well. Absolutely. Um, so that was my number nine, Coda. Dave, what do you have number nine? So my number nine is a film we just reviewed just a, just recently. It's hitting Apple TV Plus on January 14th, so a lot more people will be able to see this very soon, and that's The Tragedy of Macbeth from Joel Cohen, starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. And just we talked about it recently, it's Macbeth, people know the plot, so I don't want to uh, belabor the point too much, but I think it's a really impressive interpretation and uh, adaptation of the Macbeth tragedy namely because the lighting and the staging go such a long way for a movie that was clearly shot on the back lot. And it's a really, I think, hypnotic form of cinematography, use of shadows and framing and everything is really precise. And again, shows you that even if you're not shooting on location, you can still make shit look fantastic. And this is definitely one of those. Uh, Also, this is a film that's just so well acted that Frances McDormand's like the fifth most significant performance in the film, and she does play Lady Macbeth. Um, obviously, Frances McDormand, one of the greatest living actresses, so the fact that she's kind of being uh, acted off the stage at times by Corey Hawkins and Alex Hassel and Denzel himself, as well as uh, Catherine Hunter, who plays the witches, I think that, that speaks a lot to just how everyone is up on their game in the tragedy of Macbeth. Definitely something I would recommend people check out on Apple uh, because it's about to be there. Uh, also, a nice performance from Harry Melling, who just continues to have a really nice character actor run post uh, Harry Potter. And yeah, I mean, it's Shakespeare, so it's always going to be good. Uh, well, this is certainly a movie I'm looking forward to watching. Um, I, I wish I could say more about your your first two on your list because I just haven't had a chance to watch them yet. Yeah. But uh we will be able to soon. And you can, we can, of course, watch uh, number 10 already. Dave, moving on to number eight for me. And I think you have this on your list. The Last Duel from Ridley oh, Scott. Yeah. Number five for me. Number five. Uh, if you had told me, start of 2021, Ridley Scott was going to drop two movies this year. And the one that would make my list is the one from about the medieval times and not yeah. House of Gucci. I would have called you crazy. But... The Last Duel, unlike House of Gucci, I think is much more thoughtful 
mm-hmm. and it's telling and it's obviously a more serious telling of the story than house gucci which is more tongue-in-cheek and absurd yeah. just want to say real quick house of gucci was in like my top 20 so Same. uh no 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 shots of house of gucci the last duel in, in terms of structure of storytelling you know telling it from the perspective of sir jean Carew, and yeah. then jacques Legree in the second part and then the truth uh in the jody Cummer, marguerite de Carew, um Liddy Carew, uh, end of the yeah. movie, mm-hmm. last third, just really hammers home um, the the point of the movie, which I think is to explore how women, um, you know, I, I could say during this time, but throughout history and even now still, are often the victims of uh, sexual assault and their stories get totally taken away from them by men in power the men in these situations they get um skewed and blamed and are forced a lot of times and this is one of the points of the final act to not tell their stories because it's safer for them or it's Mm -hmm. uh the a way that they protect themselves and you know you can look at this movie and enjoy it just for Matt Damon and Adam Driver and Ben Affleck being, uh, you know, playing their parts to varying roles of seriousness and hamming it up. Or you can take it for the storytelling or the awesome uh, cinematography and set design. It's there's so much to love about it. And uh, I I just was blown away by this. And, you know, Ridley Scott, obviously, we should know he's going to give us something good. But this was beyond my expectations. Yeah, absolutely. I think when you're watching The Last Duel and then you you learn something by watching it that was not apparent in the trailer, that this is a three-act structure with three different pers- character perspectives, you're going to go back in time and see it, how it's being remembered by somebody else. When you when you go to that first, that first flashback, you're like, oh, wait, now I'm going to get Lagree's perspective. We're going to get Adam Driver's thoughts and everything we just saw. I mean, that really blew my mind when I saw that. I was like, oh, wow, this is brilliant. And you can pretty quickly understand where it's going. And yet, it just drives its point home so well. I, I, I really love how Damon's performance changes throughout the movie. Obviously, his memory of himself, uh, Karu's memory of himself, very noble and just and the best knight in the land. We kind of see that completely downward spiral. Agrees, like, ah, this guy's kind of a bristly dick. The rest of the men don't really like him. Uh, And then, of course, we get uh, Marguerite's perspective where, oh, yeah, he's also a dipshit husband. He's not actually that noble at all. And just watching Damon spiral down like that as he uglies himself up, very impressive. The Ben Affleck performance as the local lord, pure camp, amazing use of Affleck. And Comer, who has to carry so much of the emotional weight in the film, just really nails it and, and lives up to that promise she's demonstrated since Killing Eve season one that she's a top tier talent and a lot of people have expressed that they don't have an interest in watching Last Duel because you are seeing the sexual assault portrayed on screen not once but twice because you get driver's memory as well as of course the truth uh, of how it went down I totally understand that it's not a movie that glorifies that because by the end when we see who wins the duel And there's all the celebration and hype as all the people are excited to get all amped up for the dual ending. You don't feel good. You feel like Marguerite. You feel like absolute shit at -hmm. the end. And, you know, the the screenplay just by Damon Affleck and Nicole Hobson, I think it's just really brilliant and uh, just really admirable. It's a shame the movie didn't make too much money given its cost. You hope that doesn't prevent people from making something as well as this was made because the period detail the the final duel but even just all the castle stuff like everything looks so fantastic and it's a it's a really special film i really love it uh the last duel my number eight dave's number five dave what's your what's your number eight my number eight from one legend uh, filmmaker to another steven spielberg's west side story remake just recently dropped about a month ago on one hand, feels a little weird to put a remake on the top 10. Then again, 
I already have Mc, Tragedy of Macbeth on the list, the like 25th version of Macbeth. So uh, <laughs> that that's out the window. But honestly, a lot like Little Women 2019 from Greta Gerwig, Spielberg's West Side Story remake is just a remarkable reimagining of a story people know, makes a lot of choice and impactful changes to the screenplay, thanks to Tony Kushner's contributions there. And this delivers on the acting side of things, the set piece side of things. Of course, the music is going to be great. And it's just, I, I was really impressed with how much I liked it. And the fact that I went with this, because, you know, for a lot of the year, I had John Chu's In the Heights in my top 10, which I also think is a very successful, fantastic musical adaptation. But West Side Story actually kind of one up In the Heights for me in a sense, because I think everything is just, even better and you have just some real two real dynamite acting performances from rachel ziegler and ariane debose who both are singing their own songs and the dancing is incredible debose in uh the america set piece just kind of blows any past rendition of that that number out of the water at this point that's her reel for the oscar definitely seems like she's very much in that supporting actress mix and also, Mike faced as Riff, bringing a real edge to the role that we haven't really seen before uh, in, in the, the past film. Uh, just a real vibrant adaptation, just full of life. Really great. Yeah, so this was my number seven. Um, the question going into the year was, why? <laughs> why remake this? Uh, obviously, the original won, uh, what, 10 Academy Awards? Yep, what you best picture. Have? Um, so, you know, uh, obviously Steven Spielberg has spoken at length about how he was a fan of this as a child, watched it a lot, I think really inspired a lot of his love for cinema. So you can kind of understand why he wanted to do this, but did we need this? And my answer coming out of it was maybe we didn't need it, but I'm sure as hell glad we got it because it is, it's a lot in the best way possible. It's like overload of beautiful music beautiful costume, vibrant colors, amazing set. Um, the camera movement during yeah. the dancing is unbelievable. And just throughout the set is unbelievable. Um, a lot of the the shots are super memorable. I mean, we both, if you're watching youtube.com slash nostalgia pod, we both have different shots from the movie that just stick in your mind. Then you have obviously like the fight scene where the, the shadows, you know, yeah. converge oh, on each other, things like that. The movie just in general is so expertly made, amazing performances, uh, budding stars coming out of this, um, undoubtedly. Um, the the most established star, Ansel Elgore, is probably the person you least talk about leaving the movie. Um, Definitely. Because, uh, Rachel Ziegler and Ariana DeBose, like you said, blow him off the screen as well as Mike Face. So um, if you haven't seen this or if you're reluctant to, uh, definitely i recommend checking it out just i forgot to mention this when we first reviewed it uh leaving my my theater a girl who was sitting like in like the perfect seat like a couple rows up uh right in the middle was absolutely inconsolable at the end of this movie yeah i don't know if this was her first time seeing it fucking chino <laughs> yeah spielberg just yeah na nailed the emotional beats at the end of it as well so uh a well done movie through and through um west side story your number eight my number seven so dave what's your number seven one last thing on west side story i thought the choice to not provide subtitles for yes the spanish spoken by the puerto rican characters at time was really important and i think really effective and the script allowed itself to fit that in so even if someone really has no spanish knowledge at all has no idea what they're saying you still follow along it just felt even more authentic and of course this version of west side story actually casting latinos care uh, latino actors as latino yes. characters uh something you'd think we would uh take for granted but they didn't do it back in the day so uh, better late than never i suppose but yes my number seven is king richard warner brothers hbo max the story of richard venus and i guess also serena williams Starring, of course, Will Smith, 
as Richard Williams, one of the most famous and notorious sports dads. And watch this on HBO Max. I actually didn't make it to the theater for this one, but uh, it was really hard not to be taken with the Will Smith performance. He's definitely right there running for best actor. Him versus Cumberbatch seems to be the battle there. I think it's really uh, just because it's Will Smith doing what Will Smith always does, but slightly tweaking it. He's still just as charismatic and cinematic as Will Smith, the movie star of the last 30 years, is. But because he's playing Richard Williams, he's not quite as attractive as Will Smith normally is. Kind of has a weird gait. He kind of talks out of the side of his mouth, but still has that Will Smith twinkle. I think it's absolutely fantastic and like it's more of a sports film than a traditional biopic and I like the way that structure alters how the movie is paced and it doesn't end in the rousing cliche ending that you expect of a lot of sports movies. It's not uh, Venus Williams getting to the top of the mountain. It's not actually how it ends but I just found it really uplifting and also really propulsive as we kind of go through the story. We get a great John Bernthal performance as Rick Macy. Along the way, Bernthal actually playing a good guy for once in this. Also, I think central to the movie really succeeding is that Anjana Ellis' character, the mother, is not sidelined, is not just being someone to interact with Richard, but a full character all on her own and a great performance as well. So uh, King Richard, you know, like West Side Story, didn't set the box office ablaze but uh, everyone who watches it uh, has doesn't really have anything bad to say about it yeah I, I agree with your assessment um uh i don't think i i didn't love this movie I, I think it's solid and i think will smith deserves a nomination um as you know best performance best uh, actor um I, I think for me the the thing about the the movie that didn't totally grab me was it, it felt a bit like meandering at times um and i i did find myself wanting just to, to see more about like serena obviously you go in you're like venus and serena and like it ends up being a little bit more just about venus and dad uh and richard obviously but um uh, still it's undeniable that smith is just fantastic in this and overall a solid movie so a good choice for your number seven we're going to move forward to my number six which is last night in soho um, the Edgar Wright movie from this year came out around came out around uh, Halloween this year, which I appreciated. You know, it's got a spooky vibe to it, some some definite horror and, and scary scenes in it. Um, not Baby have, Driver. No, it is it is not. You have Thomas and McKenzie as Ellie, uh, this uh, design student. Um, yep, it's moves to London. Right. Um, yeah yeah fashion design yeah fashion design yes thank you uh who moves to london from a, a small town in england or in, yeah. yeah somewhere in england up, upstate uh, up upland somewhere and uh she's thrown into this world where she doesn't really fit in can't having a hard time making friends gets this apartment and starts having these really lucid dreams where she is embodying sadie played by queen's gambit star anya taylor joy um and she's back in 1960s london yeah uh and man i don't know if there's a scene that was just more like cinema than that first time that you're like seeing sadie walking into that like dance music hall with uh what was the james bond movie that was no it was uh was it Octopussy that they had that was coming out? Or I, I can't remember what. Oh, yeah. Or Spy Who Loved Me, maybe. Yeah, it's like one that. of those yeah. two. A Roger Moore and joint. And there's just lights and it's, you know, 1960s England. And you have uh, her dancing around with uh, Matt Smith, who plays this character named Jack, who seems like he's really the villain of this. Now, th- it's not a perfect movie. There's certainly some problems, I think, in the storytelling in the second half, but the psychological mm. aspect of it really kept me on my toes the whole time. I did not see the twists coming at the end. Same. Um, that, I was trying to figure out the twists and I didn't get them right. I know. S- same here. And, you know, you have Diana Rigg and you're like, is she really just going to be like the the jolly old tenant or, you know, a landlord yeah. of, of yeah. this room? Uh, and of course, she's not. She ends up being uh, Anya Taylor Joy's character as an old woman and you 
find out that you're actually seeing uh, the movie or in, in the dreams through the eyes of the killer <laughs> who's murdering all these Johns. Um, I, I thought the way that this movie made me feel throughout where it's just like the tension just rose and rose and rose. And by the end, you're just, you don't know what the twist is. You don't know what's happening. I don't think like the final scene where everything catches on fire totally works and it kind of yada yada some stuff, but yeah, I didn't have much more fun at an actual movie theater than this movie. So my number six, I'd say, um, did it make your top 10? I don't think so. Right. It it did not, but uh, yeah, this is some of the second half plot um, issues kind of hold me back from it. But nice to see Thomas and Mackenzie really thrive in a full-fledged leading performance. Honestly, it's not as much Ian Taylor Joy as you'd want, given the past few years she's had. And, you know, I think for Edgar Wright, it's not as, um, it's a little more straightforward filmmaking than I expect from him. But it's still pretty admirable even if it's like quote unquote like lesser Edgar Wright you know there's still a lot of uh, pieces to to enjoy about it but again once again another movie that uh people did not not support so I hope it's getting watched on VOD uh before we we move on to your number six just want to say the needle drop of Susie and the Banshees uh happy house during like the school dance is also another uh cinema moment for sure yeah Dave, what was your number six? My number six was a movie I did not expect anything from. Yeah, maybe going in is Pig, Michael Sarnowski's directorial debut, starring Nicolas Cage in his best performance in recent memory. And this is a neon release. It's now available on Hulu. For those who haven't seen it, it came out of its summer. And, you know, a film. On its surface, again, you get that premise. You're like, huh, truffle hunter secluded in the woods outside Portland looks for truffles with his trusty truffle pig. Someone steals his pig. He needs to take his pig back. Taken with an animal is what you think the movie's going to be, and it's not what the movie is. And what it is instead is an incredible character film where Nicolas Cage honestly just absolutely crushes it also, shout out Alex Wolf, who was really great as his scene uh, as Cage's scene partner in most things, um, in most scenes. Wolf uh, in this as long alongside old the M Night movie, really nice year from him. But Pig really, uh, really surprised me. I did not expect to, uh, I did not expect to see it go where it went. And the beats, those family beats, those connection beats, those how people process grief. Honestly, all land, and you just don't see him coming. And then when you when you watch the movie, it's like, oh wow, this is so much more uplifting yet existential. I did not, I did not see this coming. I thought this was Nicolas Cage fucking up Portland, you know? Yeah, yeah and especially from the movie uh, posters, you know, it's the, the close up. If you're watching YouTube.com/slash Nostalgia Pod, stay plug in. If you're watching, you can see my background. His face is all beaten and bruised and when you hear the premise that this pig has been stolen you obviously like you said go the Neeson route but I was so surprised at how this movie is such a meditation on grief in the sense of actual loss that loss of a person or a pet that you care about but also in terms of like grief around a time of your life and like uh cage plays uh ethan feld this uh ex chef i guess he's still a chef technically um who chose to stop working um because he felt like well after he lost partner that it was like taking from his soul and taking from what really felt meaningful and purposeful in his life and that scene where he meets with the chef of the restaurant he remembers him as like a line cook and just totally like kind of like dresses him down but not in like a sense of like berating him but just like is this really what you want to be doing with your life you didn't want this yeah (laughs) he's like you wanted to run a pub you wanted to make like bar food like this is not who you are and like how you're selling yourself just to have whatever this is just like really sticks with you it's Mm. really been sitting with me and then that that scene between 
Amir and his dad and uh, Ethan at the end where, you know, he makes that the the meal that Darius and his wife had. And you see Darius just slowly break down and you, you see like yeah, Amir and his dad kind of have this moment of like remembering. It's just like so tenderly written and shot and performed. And yeah, a total surprise. This, this was my number four for the year if I didn't say it. Um, and I'm just totally blown away at this being Michael Sarnos- Sarnowski's directorial debut. Like, <laughs> this is what he does in his debut. I'm, I'm all in for whatever's next. So, my number four, your number six of the year, Pig. Um, Dave, we're moving on to my number five now, which I did not expect to be in my top ten <laughs> before it hit Disney Plus and I could watch it. But Encanto, um, man. Uh, we don't talk about Bruno dog, but we, we do talk about Encanto because this, I, I like to have at least like one animated film usually up here. If I can, I think last year sold me my top 10 the year. Yeah. A couple years before was Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. That'd probably be 2019. So Encanto <laughs> falls this high though, because not only am I just like, I can't believe how good animation is now. Like, I feel like I watch a lot of animation uh, movies, uh, at least the, the the good ones that we talk mm-hmm. about and like the, the popular ones, I should say. But this was like very lifelike and almost like kind of off-putting at first at how uh, precise the animation was and the movements were. But the story that this tells about grief as well as family roles and what it means to be special, what it means to have a talent, how you let that define who you are, who you, who you're meant to be um, was just like so moving. And the, not only is the music by Lin-Manuel Miranda really good, as we mentioned, we don't talk about Bruno has been like number one on Spotify streaming for like seven out of the last like eight or nine days, like something like that. It's It's number one right now. I just checked. (laughs) Insane. Um, but beyond the music, the story between uh, uh, what's her name, Maria, mm-hmm. and her grandmother, and her siblings, and aunts and uncles and cousins, is just so it really grabs you. But it's really moving and well thought out, and you get some really moving and emotional scenes in the second half that are totally tear inducing um i I was in tears multiple times watching this movie just because it's so nice and uh i felt incredibly validated with my feelings on this because i saw andy greenwald of uh (laughs) the ringer also saying that this was one of his favorite movies of the year and i i just stand that man because like this is one of those movies where you can totally write it off as just being a kid's movie and disney especially has been going in this direction of not having a villain right you know that was frozen too yeah, issue with Frozen 2, or not an issue if you liked Frozen 2. Um, this, in this, it totally works because I think, as someone who has done like family therapy before, studied family dynamics, family roles, this just really is up my alley, really speaks to me. And I was also super impressed with Stephanie Beatrice, who obviously yeah. I've watched on Brooklyn Nine Nine. And like, was it in the Heights too? Yeah. And, she, on Brooklyn Nine Nine, where I, I first have been introduced to her, she's such like a stoic and like flat character, and that's kind of her, the whole point of her. Um, the way she her vocal performance is just totally amazing, and then you get John Leguizamo just kind of like jumping in and being Bruno, and uh, also super charming. I, I thought this was great, and uh, if you have Disney Plus, I implore you to go watch this because you won't regret it. Yeah, I think probably the best choice about it in Kanto is at the end, Mirabelle doesn't get a power. Yeah. And it's totally good. And you you don't care. But she's and, had a power all along. That's the thing. Yeah. Like, but. And shout out Lynn. Uh, more original songs from him. That's first time doing this for Disney. Of course, he did the Moana songs too. But you can hear the Lynn-ness of it sometimes. You can hear a little bit of Hamilton in there. Obviously, this has been on the mind with, you know, him directing Tick, Tick, Boom. And of course, In the Heights coming out. But when, when Lin-Manuel Miranda, like, hits on a song on a melody you you really can't fuck with it like it's just really good shit <laughs> we don't talk about bruno uh so number five in kanto dave what's your number five my number five is the last duel so my number four is 
The Power of the Dog, Netflix, Jane Campion's first film in over 10 years, starring Benedict Cumberbatch, Kirsten Dunst, Jesse Plemons, Cody Smith-McPhee. Man, something I knew people liked going in, but didn't really know much about it. Obviously not familiar with the novel it's adapted from. And when you watch the film, you don't, I don't really know what, what's going to happen. You know, Western film, the West, the, the West has been, uh, the, the West is closed time timing, you know, post Indian wars, all that stuff. And yet what you get, not an adventure film, but a really subtle, uh, intentional, slow, intentionally slow moving plot that once it unravels and once you really get under the skin of these core characters, I don't understand how you can't be impressed because the storytelling is honestly really brilliant. And along the way, you have great performances and New Zealand is an amazing stand-in for Old West Montana. It looks fucking incredible. And yeah, didn't really have expectations going in, but it's uh, I feel like it's impossible not to be wowed by the storytelling here, even if to some, but yeah, it might be a little slow, but that's kind of the point. You work up to it. Uh, Power of the Dog is my number three, and for all the reasons that you said, but as you watch the movie for the first time, you keep trying to figure out what is really going to happen here. You know, there's a lot of undertones of... Uh, homophobia and then you kind of move into the oh this is a, a closeted man who maybe is going to start a relationship with this this young man who's moving into his sexuality and then there's tension there and then there's the tension between Cumberbatch and Dunst and Cumberbatch and uh, Jesse Plemons and you're like where is this going like what's going to really be like the message that this sends home and then it turns out to be this like revenge tale <laughs> and such a subtle revenge tale and such like a, a detailed plot that <laughs> once you kind of see the reveal you almost like the movie ends and you're like what like you, you have to like go back and piece it together and, and then you kind of that eureka moment where it's like oh my god that is so brilliant yeah and the way it's shot and just told and all the little details about it it tells so many different aspects of the story we're really having this central story of like don't fuck with this dude's mom. Don't fuck with Kirsten Dunst when <laughs> you have, uh, what's his name? Co- Cody Smollett. Um, Cody Smith McPhee. Co- Cody Smith McPhee, thank you. Uh, as, as her son, because he's going to fuck you up in the most subtle way possible. Yeah. Yeah. And then Cumberbatch also, tremendous performance from him, different side than we've grown accustomed to from Benedict, but he does it really. Nominated. Oh, of course. And, and he could very well win. He could very well beat Will Smith. Um, we'll see. But it, it's one of those characters that feels so finely written that when you start to peel the layers off of him, it really uh, heightens how good the Cumberbatch performance is. And Cody Smith McPhee, who's been around but has never really um, been sh- shown something like this, um, a tremendous performance from him. And also nice to see Dunst continue her kind of comeback run. And Jesse Plemons, almost an afterthought when it comes to the ensemble, just because he's just, oh yeah, there's Jesse Plemons doing what he does, but he really does play off Cumberbatch well as these two brothers that are more or less polar opposites. Yeah. Uh, there's there's not really much more I think we can even say about this movie that hasn't been said. It's going to be in the discussion. We'll be talking about it more as we get into the Oscars. Yeah. Um, I think Campion, Campion's the favorite for best director, and, and r- rightfully so. She would be the uh, uh, second or the first woman to ever win best director twice. Absolutely, um, Dave. We're getting down to it here. My number four was Pig. My number three is Power of the Dog. So I think we're down to your number three. Yes, my number three is Licorice Pizza. Paul Thomas Anderson. Even minor PTA is still really good. And for me, Paul Thomas Anderson's Licorice Pizza, a really satisfying watch. Uh, Completely transformative to 1970s Encino, San Fernando Valley, LA area coming of age story. And 
was quite blown away by, I think, Cooper Hoffman, son of the late Philip Seymour Hoffman, really strong in his acting debut, but tremendously blown away by Alana Haim of the rock band Haim, because I wouldn't have thought she would be nearly as impressive as an actor, but these two really, really sell it. And it's more of a Alana movie, but I just think that, you know, the themes of kind of growing up and feeling uh, fulfilled in what your life has been, a lot of it's really familiar stuff. I think it's so ex- executed on so well. You have the period detail, you have the soundtrack, you have tons of memorable bit roles from people like Benny Safdie and Bradley Cooper and Tom Waits and Sean Penn, et cetera, that I, for me, it's just really hard not to just have so much fun watching. And I really can't wait to watch it again because I feel like there's so much more to catch watch, watching the movie another time. And obviously a lot's been made about the relationship between these two characters, given the age difference. But I would say it's a pretty nuanced and subtle, if transgressive, um, take on this sort of relationship. And I think done really well. The only thing I didn't really like about it was I thought the uh, Asian caricature stuff didn't really add anything to yeah. the movie. It was pretty off-putting as soon as it happens but other than that i I quite liked it unfortunately that got the biggest laugh in my theater so that was yeah. uh, a bit disheartening um to me uh did not make my list in my top 20 uh even like you said even like low-grade pta is still top tier movie stuff and there are so many great parts of this just didn't just didn't totally catch me maybe it was when i saw it um I, I've always been more of a, a Danny Elheim fan, so maybe, maybe that, that's it as well. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I kind of wish they had kept this as Soggy Bottom instead of changing it to Licorice Pizza, just because that's such a a more uh, central part to the movie, the Soggy Bottom uh, yeah. aspect. But yeah, still, Licorice Pizza is just like a, a reference to a old business chain from yeah. that time. But yeah, Soggy Bottom is actually like part of the film. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I think there's so many like fun parts to this. Whether it's like Bradley Cooper as uh, what was John this Peters, again? yes, John Peters, um, or you have Sean Penn as Jack Holden, like reenacting his like jump in that movie, yeah, uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai. Um, yeah, it's good stuff, man. It's really good stuff. It's it's fun. It's fun to be in that world. It feels very Once Upon a Time in Hollywood esque, like the PTA totally. spin on it almost. Yeah. So. Well, Dave, that takes us down to our top two which I think we have the same one. Oh, yeah. uh, so our number two is also the same, which is Dune from Denny Villeneuve. Let's Dave, go. Why is your number two? Let's go, year? baby. <laughs> uh, it's a miracle Dune is as good as it is. Obviously, the Frank Herbert acclaimed science fiction novel has long been deemed unfilmable, so much so that you had a really out there Dave, David Lynch adaptation that wasn't very well liked if if acquiring cold status. And also... Jodorowsky literally giving up trying to make it. People have been wanting to make Dune for so long, and they haven't been able to do it. And then Denny and Warner Brothers and Legendary, they fucking did it. And yeah, it's they're breaking it up two parts for Dune, the first Dune novel. Honestly, I think they handled the breakup perfectly. I love the way this movie ends. It ends quietly. It doesn't end with a final battle. Uh, incredible choice. And it's just a engrossing blockbuster with amazing set design shooting on location in Jordan for the Arrakis desert scenes goes a long, long way. The action looks incredible. It's really cool. Of course, in the Dune world, they don't actually shoot guns. So you see all this melee combat it looks fucking awesome. The sense of scale with these really big, ugly looking spaceships goes so go so so far and i mean i i love jason momoa's supporting performance as duncan idaho one of the honestly i think one of the best acting performances of the year he absolutely nails Great performance name. the energy is spot on it fits the movie so well oscar isaac as mm-hmm. uh duke leto crushes it and chalamet who has a lot uh i think a lot riding on performance i think acquits himself quite well in his first like big like you know ip role uh, I've watched the movie twice. I, I I just really love it. I think it it, it handles the dreaminess and kind of out there shit that is about that, that is the central 
thesis of Dune quite well. The exposition is handled, I think, very coherently because there is a lot of data dumping that needs to be done for the audience to understand this world and the politics and everything. But I just think everything really works. And yeah, not only does it work, but it's really great. Uh, whenever I've talked to anybody about Dune, and I talked about this in our review, check that check that out, go back and listen to it. I think we did a pretty good job with it. Uh, this movie made me say audibly out loud, wow, several times. <laughs> the scale of this thing is just unbelievable. Denny does scale better than anybody yeah. in making movies right now, I'd say. And uh, like you said, whether it's the sweeping huge ships or the enormous invasion and just the, the like people running across a field, <laughs> you know, the the scene with Brolin as the, he runs out into battle and we don't really see him again again after that it's just like yeah. it really is just an image like burned into my memory because it's so visceral and like shot from the ground so you can see everybody dropping down onto the battlefield it's it's like overwhelming but in a really like satisfying way like you said i think the exposition of it all one of the issues i think in telling a story of dune a story on the scale i think is done really expertly you become invested in the relationships that they want you to be invested in and you get some really great payoffs you know Duncan Idaho gets one of the I think the coolest like send offs in a movie with his like final battle just like a <laughs> amazing last uh, act of bravery on his part. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, so many scenes just are unbelievable to think about the scene where Duke Leto is, you know, incapacitated and naked in that chair, as he's talking to um, what's his the, the, the big guy. The, the Harkonnen uh, yes, head played uh, by uh, uh, Peter uh, Skarsgård um, is just uh, Stellan Skarsgård. I'm sorry. Stalin, sorry. Baron yeah. Harkonnen. Um, it's just like another image that is so perfect and you just are watching the whole thing and you're just like oh, the, the, to the way they build the drama, the way they build the intensity of the scene. And, you know, he kind of like lures him in knowing he has like the cyanide capsule that's going to explode into his face. It's just like man so many scenes about this and just talking about it, i'm getting hyped i want to go back and watch it again uh the sandworms unbelievable love yeah. the sandworms um i think the whole like uh hand in the box aspect is is mm-hmm. he the one is is done really well and yeah i think all the performances really really work dune is uh last year tenet was my number one movie because it felt like i was at the movies again and uh the just the pure um, imagery and overwhelmingness of it was, and never seeing something like that on screen executed in that way. And Dune, I think is another thing like, like Tenet where it's something that I think the story is told better than Tenet. This would have been higher on my list than Tenet would have been last year. Mm -hmm. Um, But just, I've never seen something like this on screen done this well. It's, it's really, really impressive. And if you have HBO, uh, is this still on HBO? I don't think it is. No, anymore. not anymore. This, no. this did come out back in uh, October, so those thirty days are long gone. It'll it'll return. Uh, one did day. you go to the theater to see it a second time? Oh no, I, I saw it uh, in the theater the first time. My oh, guy. Okay. <laughs> and let me tell you, it fucking rips. <laughs> um, yeah, it came well, out of my birthday. Talk about that. We we have a uh, we have Hans Zimmer on the score here, right? Uh, yeah, spasm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that's just like an afterthought on all this. Like yeah, one one yeah. of the if not the goat yeah. uh composer. I, I mean time. Javier Bardem and Zendaya have the smallest of roles as the key <laughs> Fremen characters. Obviously they'll have big parts in part two. Yeah. But it doesn't matter, man. Oh my god. Yeah. There's so so many so many set pieces. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson's great is uh, Lady Jessica, uh the Ben Jesuit stuff with uh Charlotte Rampling in the beginning. Uh crushing it crushing it like i think they do and that because i've read some of the, the the novel as well i think they do a really good job with dune of telling you uh the plot mechanics just enough for the audience to not be completely lost but then honestly kind of get getting on with it because i think you just start really hitting all these memorable scenes and then next thing you know it's this really propulsive chase film to wrap it up and we get another one like it, it's so exciting Dune, our number two, which, Dave, that brings us to our number ones, which, I mean, if anyone's listened to the pod, 
at all this year. They knew this was coming. The Green Knight. Uh, David Lowry, man. Talk about director on the rise. Um, you know, coming off of Old Man the Gun, a ghost story before that. I did not expect to see this sort of movie from him. But man, The Green Knight. We, when we talked about it, we were like little kids to talk about. We were like giggling. It was just so fucking good. And it still has just stuck with me all year. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell me why The Green Knight's number one, dude. The moment I saw The Green Knight at the end of July, I was like, that's the best movie I've seen this year. Going to be hard for anyone to top that. You know what? Nobody fucking topped that shit, dude. <laughs> Green Knight's so... It's a fucking miracle. Honestly, absolute knockout film. It's so intentional, yet so open for interpretation. It doesn't do hardly anything you expect, yet still is impossible to look away from. Absolutely love this movie. And I see on the cake, Alicia Vikander, back in a good flick once again. You know what? I'm feeling good about the Vikander Renaissance. Took a little time off, had a child with the guy Michael Fassbender. Now she's back. Dual role in the Green Knight, very effective. But of course, are they together? She's married to Michael Fassbender for several years now. Yes, I did not know that. That's oh, yeah. news to me. And I, I, I do stand. Together. Yeah, but uh, the Green Knight would not be as successful as it is without Dev Patel's performance as Gawain, and he's very good. It's not your traditional coming of age story. Not your traditional, uh, literally Green Knight becoming a uh, you know Knight of the Round Table. It's not actually that. But what you start to meditate on when it comes to choice and destiny and responsibility and uh, consequences, it's just so much to dwell on. But the journey of the film, all these memorable sequences and set pieces and supporting characters, again, intentional yet open for interpretation. I think the movie's absolutely spellbinding. Yeah, um, well, well said. It's based off the 14th century poem, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Um, and Dev Patel as uh, Gawain in this is just so mesmerizing and plays the emotional ride that is uh, Gawain's rise to prominence. And then I, I wouldn't even say fall, but, you know, uh, slow march towards the consequences of the actions that brought him there. Yeah, it's just done so well and like and your ending the, yes absolutely that that flashback to then the uh, i'm ready to die now to the off with your head um amazing amazing sequence um but yeah i think the there's so many aspects of this that are done so expertly you talked about the way that this story is intentional and tells a, a story that is uh buttoned up by the end but also totally up to interpretation and you can take away from the movie a ton of different uh lessons or aspects that you can sit with for days i mean i feel like i've I've thought about different parts of this movie numerous times i thought the aspect that's kind of come back to me a lot as i thought about it is the aspect of the the fox being his mom and like kind of being this like parrot on his shoulder throughout the story kind of like talking him through or guiding him through certain parts, but also not being able to be with him at certain parts or not, uh, you know, him choosing not to have the Fox with him at certain parts. It's uh, I I found that part to be particularly um, thought provoking as I thought about it a little bit more, but I, yeah, I mean, I think we, we lauded the last duel for its set design and the realism of this medieval period, 14th century. And this movie not only looks equally as good as the duel, but some of the the choices in color and uh, shot design and cinematography. Um, the scene Dave has as his background right now, he's got this like yellow mist behind him. It's yellow Forced. glow. Yeah, and there's so many scenes like that, dude. Like, And it has this feeling of, I don't know. I don't even know the right way to say it, like awriness almost. It kind of like, feels a bit like mystical and mm. but in like the worst way possible like when he when he meets that kid in the field after the battle and he's like walking through for the first time and you're like what's going on with this kid he's so weird and yeah it's uh just so 
it, the the movie is just perfect i'd say and it's it got five stars in my letterbox i don't usually do that but yeah one of the ones that, that it, it was the only five star movie i had in 2021 it's great yeah it's great honestly <sighs> i would like to point out i think the effects work in the green knight has been quite overlooked at various awards bodies a lot of it's practical but just watch this shit with the fucking fox or yeah. the giants he comes across there's so much mm-hmm. and of, of course the makeup work for for the green knight himself but like there, there's so much imp- impeccable like filmmaking going on here and a24 um t- twice on my list of course also made tragedy of Macbeth, but uh i think this is one of their best films they've ever done and didn't do too well at the box office, of course, coming out in the summer, but I hope this finds a long, fruitful life on streaming and VOD because you're going to be seeing video essays on YouTube till the end of time about this one, man. People love this shit. Yeah, absolutely. Dave, that brings us to the end of our lists. You want to recap yours? 10 to 1, I'll do mine, then we'll talk about some superlatives. Yeah, so 10, Riders of Justice, 9, The Tragedy of Macbeth, 8, West Side Story, 7, King Richard, Six, Pig. Five, The Last Duel. Four, The Power of the Dog. Three, Licorice Pizza. Two, Dune. And one, The Green Knight. Actually, just looking at this, only one Netflix film this year. And that's, of course, The Power of the Dog. I think it's the same for yeah. my list as well. Um, ten, Belfast. Nine, Coda. Eight, The Last Duel. Seven, West Side Story. Six, The Last uh, Last Night in Soho. Five, Encanto. Four, Pig. Three, the power of the dog, two, Dune, and one, the Green Knight. Dave, honorable mentions. Anything you want to shout out, real quick? Uh, yeah. So you kind of touched on some stuff like Belfast, but uh, I'd shout out Parallel Mothers, Pedro Almodovar's film that didn't make my list. Hmm. Also, The French Dispatch from Wes Anderson. Not the best Wes Anderson movie, but still a admirable and good movie nonetheless. And uh, Sean Baker's Red Rocket which uh yeah also from a24 i like that uh that one quite a bit and oh and a few movies that are probably a little less well seen uh paul verhoeven's v- benedetta uh is some wild ass shit man hot nuns <laughs> and uh shiva baby was hilarious yeah an unexpected hit good one that's a good that's a really good one um we we should also say we uh we decided not to include judas and the black messiah on this I think it would have made both of our lists it would have yeah we did um it was on in last year's award season so it felt like it was in a weird purgatory where would it have fallen on your list you think i think i might have had it either right behind or right in front of dune man uh at the top top five for sure yeah uh judas as well as other stuff like uh the father and uh the foreign film uh kavoda saida like a lot of movies like technically came out in 2021 or consumed by everyone in 2021, but if the Oscar season hadn't been delayed, they would have been released in 2020. So felt kind of weird to honor them this, this late, but still should shout them out. Also, uh, should note, no, there's a few movies we still haven't seen for 2021 that are on a lot of lists, such as uh, Hamaguchi's Drive My Car, which I'm very eager to see. Yeah. Uh, Joachim Trier's The Worst Person in the World. Uh, the doc anime documentary flea and also celine siama's petite maman much like portrait of lady on fire we didn't get to see it till after we made our lists and now we're not going to get to see her follow up until after we've made our lists feels like uh those couple of those movies might be in that weird purgatory like messiah for next year um just a couple more i want to shout out no sudden move soderberg i thought it was really good uh totally enjoyed uh that performance from not only Don Cheadle, but Benicio Del Toro as well. Uh, Tick, Tick, Boom. Total mm-hmm. surprise, didn't it? I yeah. mean, uh, Lin-Manuel's first uh, big screen directorial debut. Yeah. Um, didn't see not, that Not musical, but uh, uh, yeah, Andrew Garfield, man. I mean, we're going to, I was going to ask in a second, who's on the rise? He's got to be a big winner from this year. Not only, I think, uh, delightful surprise from No Way Home and people were, are kind of like standing him as uh, yeah. a good Spider-Man again, but yeah, he's in Tick Tick Boom. He's in this. Uh, he was in Eyes of Tammy Faye. Yeah, uh, earlier earlier in the year, he was in um, oh, Mainstream. Man, we, yeah, Mainstream. Which love it or hate it, he was going for it. He so. tried. <laughs> yeah, shout out to Garfield. Yeah, um, and then you know we did we mentioned it, but House of Gucci really was fun. Yeah, so totally. totally. Want to give that a shout? 
Um, any other performances that you remember from this year? Anything that stood out? Hmm, I'm trying to think of stuff we haven't discussed. Oh, I, I think Kristen Stewart's really great in Spencer. You know, Spencer mm. is a transformative, non-traditional biopic, very meditative, very um, in the mind. But I think Stewart's really going for it and really nails it. Yeah, uh, that that's a really good one. Um, I'm trying to th- I'm trying to think of the same performances that I wanted to shout out. I mean, you mentioned Red Rocket, Simon uh, Rex in that yep. is really really good. Um, first half of Matrix Resurrections. Uh, yeah maybe one of the best halves of a movie ever. Um, Jessica Anwick, really good in that. Old was a nice uh, return to form for M. Night. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think it's a perfect movie, but still really fun. I'm trying to think. Uh, biggest disappointment this year. Do you have one? Yeah, so I, I was looking. I don't have like a huge disappointment the way I did for like music and television. The stuff that disappointed me is, you know, stuff like, you know, fa- Fast 9, Fast and Furious 9. Mm-hmm kind of let me down in a sense but i mean it's not that big a deal it's the ninth fast movie they can't all be really good um and i guess marvel's eternals i mean they they finally had a miss but it's like their first one in ages so again not not the biggest deal and yeah i mean there there's stuff that just doesn't work you mentioned mainstream i guess the woman in the window i kind of was hoping yeah. would be good and it just totally was not uh but yeah there... nothing nothing else oh and uh, boogie I, I should acknowledge Eddie Huang's Boogie, which I thought had the best trailer of 2021. You know, Pop Smoke's Got It On Me as the music in that, the the the, the basketball New York City film. Mm-hmm. The trailer is just so much better than the film, and the film kind of let me down with a lot of like sloppy mistakes, honestly. Uh, you're you're missing the biggest disappointment of the year. You're just missing it. It's called The Little Things by John Lee Hancock. Ah, Man, yes. you have Rami Malek, Denzel, Jared Leto, yep. and you end up with that. Three Oscar winners, <laughs> dude. Just a total pile of steaming poop, unfortunately. And that, you know, it's it's still like watchable. It's, it's just watchable. like, yeah, just not what you would hope would come out of that. That was my bit, my biggest disappointment. But you you also mentioned my second biggest one, the woman in the window, which is mm. really bad. Also, music came out this year. We should acknowledge yeah. twenty twenty one movie, and that is maybe the most offensive and mm. poorly thought out. Movie that is of the year. my uh, that's my last place. That's yep. at the bottom uh, of the list. I, I didn't list, write it, it is yet. last. But if I could give it no stars on Letterbox, I definitely would. Um, yeah, I think I think that just about does it. Anything else you want to shout out? Uh, I think that's about it, honestly. Uh, Watch movies. You know, we got the Snyder Cut this year. That happened. <laughs> it actually was released. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that. We we got a Snyder Cut, and then we also got a good Suicide Squad. DC having a, a DC year. Yeah. Yeah, I'll totally. Take it. Yeah, n- nice, uh, nice comeback after uh, Wonder Woman 1984, which I did not like too much. Yeah. Anyways, we're going to wrap up there. Follow us at Nostalgia Pod on Twitter, SoundCloud.com slash Nostalgia Pod if you want, but mostly YouTube.com slash Nostalgia Pod and on Spotify, Nostalgia. Give us a five star rating and review. I just thought of my most disappointing movie. I just found it on the list. Studio Ghibli's Earwig and the Witch. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was not the hand drawn animation. It was 3D instead, CGI. And yeah, that was a big letdown. Goro Miyazaki is not his dad. <laughs> Certainly not. That was definitely not one of my favorite movies of the year. Um, Dave, we'll be coming to the people next week with a regular oh, yeah. podcast. Check out our pod from earlier in the week. But drop your favorite movies of the year below. What did we get right on our list? What did we get wrong? And uh, we'll. See you soon.